friends um, over here at the HEC for the first time today. I'm our executive director of the Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship. We're located on the sixth, uh, seventh floor. That was a nice walk over here uh, of Thinkbox. Um, and I'm also a professor at Weatherhead. Um, we're so thrilled to um, partner um, with our friends today. Um, Dr. Hickman and I know each other through a whole bunch of different things. Um, and uh, Mike Fisher, who I don't think is in person today, but, but joining via Zoom, um, is the former CTO of Etsy. And uh, Mike came and did a talk with us, and we started talking about AI and applications across our campus and um, reached out to Dr. Hickman and said, hey, we'd love to talk about AI and nursing. So um, we're thrilled to partner with you guys today. Um, for those that are watching on Zoom and on LinkedIn Live, I'm going to be on my computer in a second. Um, and you can sort of let me know if there's questions and I'll make sure the moderator knows. But uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Hickman. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of uh, Dean Carol Musso of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, we welcome you to the, today's event uh, called The Future of Artificial Intelligence in Nursing. And this event, as Michael said, is in collaboration with the Veal Institute. And VEAL plays an important role in catalyzing innovation and entrepreneurship and helping to connect people in a very transformative way. And Michael has been a, a strong and, and, and longstanding supporter of, of, of helping us connect in nursing to um, industry. Uh, I wanna also say thank you, Michael, uh, and your entire team for helping to uh, make today a success. And I also would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, support from the Dean's office and Maureen Kendall. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge today that today's speaker series is part of a year long ce celebration celebrating the school's 100 year legacy as a leader in nursing education, research and practice. In 1923, the Honorable Francis Payne Bolton made a historic gift of $500,000. Doesn't sound like much today, but it was a very large gift at, for its time to establish the School of Nursing here at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Congresswoman Bolton wanted the school to focus on experiential learning and nursing research, which was pretty cutting edge at the time. These were her only stipulations for her donation. And certainly a lot has changed in the last century, but our dedication to excellence in nursing education, research, and practice has remained steadfast. Now, today's conversation is quite timely. I don't know about you all joining us on Zoom, LinkedIn, and other social media platforms, and those right here in Samson, in the Samson Pavilion. But every time I look at the news or or look at a TikTok or social media channel, I, I can't help but hear about some of the potential of artificial intelligence, how it's posed to, poised to change the way we work, how we learn, and even deliver healthcare. So certainly today's speaker series and this panelist will help us better understand some of the potential applications and maybe even some of the challenges that we may face as we adopt artificial intelligence to deliver better nursing care and to optimize health here in the United States and worldwide. So for those who are uh, seeking contact hours, this is an event that does qualify for one contact hour should you stay for the entire uh, session. And at the end of this particular session, there will be a QR code where you can uh, go ahead and access. Uh, and we'll put that particular QR code and that link in the chat box for those joining us on other social media platforms. Now I'd like to introduce for this afternoon our moderator for the panel discussion. Nick Valenta. Nick is a third year BSN student, and Nick will introduce our speakers and then ask each of them a series of questions about their interest in artificial intelligence and ask them to share their perspectives on how AI enabled solutions are poised to impact nursing education, research, and practice. Nick? Thank you, Associate Dean Hickman, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to serve as the moderator today for this Veal Institute session. Uh, this is my third time being a moderator for one of these sessions, so I'm very excited uh, to be back. Um, I am a third year student in the BSN program, and as a you know, obviously as a student in the BSN program, but also just as a student in general in today's world, it's clear that AI um, is growing and changing very quickly and that it's going to become an increasingly, you know, more important part of our lives. So I'm really excited to be able to discuss this and learn with everyone here today. Uh, so today, to kind of focus on that nursing area, uh, we've 
collected a few thought leaders from the industry, from academia, uh, and from nursing practice so that we can all kind of learn and hear their perspectives um, and exchange some information on how artificial intelligence will become um, kind of more incorporated into nursing practice, what those um, potential applications look like, um, and what their ultimate influence will be on the nursing field. So first, I would like to introduce Dr. Durai. Dr. Durai is joining us via Zoom today, and we are very excited that she is here with us. Uh, she is a globally recognized thought leader and scientist in the field of cognitive computing, artificial intelligence, neural networks, and predictive analytics. Uh, she's currently the founder and CEO of Amicus Brain Innovation and is the chief artificial intelligence strategist and advisor for Sparks IQ. Dr. Durai's company, Amicus Brain, provides digital advisor apps to help simplify care decisions, save time to improve the quality of life for persons with dementia or their caregivers. Prior to creating her own company, Dr. Durai held several positions with IBM and is recognized on three occasions as one of IBM's master inventors. She has quite the resume and we're very excited to learn from her today. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mayer. Dr. Mayer is an assistant professor of nursing and is also a gerontologist. Her research program focuses on family caregiving relationships, the evaluation of online interventions to support these family caregivers, as well as policies to support the family as a whole. Dr. Mayer is currently the recipient of a clinical trial to evaluate the effectiveness of a dementia caregiver training intervention and is founded by the National Institute of Aging. Dr. Durai and Dr. Mayer are also collaborating on a pilot study um, of caregiver intervention that leverages artificial intelligence technology. So welcome, Dr. Mayer. We're very pleased that you're here today as well. Our third panelist is Dr. Voss. Dr. Voss is the Independence Foundation Professor of Nursing Education and the director of the PhD program um, at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. He is a very accomplished nurse scientist with a research program that utilizes both basic and applied methodologies to foster the understanding of underlying mechanisms in fatigue and sleep management in individuals living with HIV and other chronic conditions. In addition to his research, Dr. Voss's educational interests focus on implementation of, of evidence-based practice, excuse me, and the leveraging of big data. So we're very excited that you're with us here today, Dr. Voss. And our fourth panelist is Dr. Knighton. Dr. Knighton is an associate research professor in nursing. She's also a nurse scientist, infection preven preventionist, and solutionist. Dr. Knighton's research program is focused on applying biodesign processes to create new technologies to positively impact patient care. One example of one of these innovations is an electronic hand hygiene system for bedbound adults aimed at reducing hospital acquired infections. Dr. Knighton's research is currently funded by the National Institute on Aging. So, as you can tell, everyone has a very impressive resume here today, and we're certainly very excited to learn from each other. We have an impressive panel that covers a broad range of expertise in terms of research, education, and practice. So for the next few minutes, I'd like to gain your thoughts on a few questions and then allow our audience here at the Samson Pavilion uh, and those joining us via Zoom to provide comments and questions. So my first question is something that I would just kind of like everyone to answer here. Um, and so that question is, tell us how you first became interested in artificial intelligence and what inspired you to start thinking about how AI technology might derive transformative change in how we deliver patient care and family care as a whole. Uh, so let's start with Dr. Jarai for this question. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hickman and the entire Case Western um, no team for our for organizing this uh, uh, event and uh, inviting me to be part of this. All right, uh, Dr. Dreyer, we're having a bit of a technical um, problem at the moment, so give us just one moment here. Try right, again, please. Good no, afternoon, everyone. Her sound is not on. Yeah. Yes, you're all we good, Dr. Dreyer. We can hear you now. can hear you. Can I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay, take three. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hickman and uh, Nick, uh, for a warm welcome. And uh, I would like to thank the entire Case Western team uh, for organizing this uh, event and inviting me to be part of this conversation. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to what uh, other panelists have to say. Uh, I expected this to be a very stimulating conversation for myself and for everyone. So how did I come to be in AI? Uh, it may sound corny, but uh, my interest in AI started as, a, as my interest in cognitive development. Uh, my mother, who is an equal opportunity, uh, I would say, user, uh, used to make me do homework for my older brother, who was two grades higher, because mathematics came very easily to me. And I couldn't get past a stick 
uh, you know, uh, stick figures in drawing. So she made him contribute to my homework and I did that. And immediately at age 10, I started seeing these differences and I started wondering, born in the same family, we exhibited such uh, different skills, different talents so early on. And I knew it was the brain was the answer. You know, given the experiences that we were going through were quite similar. Uh, so uh, I wanted to, therefore, at that age, I wanted to understand how my brain worked, his brain, my brother's brain worked, and what, you know, contributed to these differences, and I wanted to be a brain surgeon. Um, but after high school, I actually went to IIT to become an electrical engineer. So I did not go to medicine, but I became an engineer, but the interest uh, prevailed throughout my life, and I've been very fortunate uh, to uh, come to the U.S. to do my uh, graduate uh, uh, degree programs. Uh, I did uh, uh, PhD in AI, understanding images, uh, understanding how human vision works and uh, modeling them uh, using computers. Uh, so throughout my career, uh, I've been fortunate to be in a place uh, where I can use lots of data, whether it is uh, after 9-11, uh, I work with the Department of Homeland Security to help emergency responders very quickly get trained on unforeseen uh, emergency events so that they can uh, help their uh, local communities. During the economic crisis, I used AI and machine learning uh, to help uh, US homeowners stay in their homes without uh, facing uh, the stigma of foreclosure. So uh, as you can see, my journey therefore throughout uh, uh, my life, my career has been started with uh, building responsible or socially responsible AI, which is what excites me. At this point in life, uh, uh, as uh, Nick introduced me, I'm actually focusing on bringing AI to uh, extend the, uh, you know, trusted care that people get in clinics, uh, uh, extend that care into their homes. Uh, since I, be, I was a caregiver for my mother with uh, Parkinson's led dementia, I, I know fully well uh, how much of a uh, burden and the pain it is to look for information and worry about its trustworthiness and uh, uh, look around for resources and so on. So that's what we have built. In Amicus Brain, we are using conversational AI systems to educate, inform, aid, care management from pre-diagnosis, diagnosis, all the way to the end of life uh, for uh, families living with uh, dementia. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Durai. It's great that you've been able to derive a very successful career out of a personal interest. That's really great to hear, and thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Dr. Mayer, would you like to tell us about how you initially got interested in artificial intelligence? Certainly, and uh, I have to give full credit to Dr. Durai on this. A year ago, I would have said I'm a skeptic. I'm a skeptic on AI. I would never have imagined that I would be integrating AI into my intervention research. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background, my research is focused on psychoeducational programs for family caregivers, oftentimes looking at designs that have been found to be very effective in clinical trials in terms of reducing caregiver depression and distress. So those are oftentimes multi-component, relatively intensive group-based programs. And you know, the great thing is we, we, we see effects for those the issue is they're not being translated very well to be made accessible um, after we do the research study. They're not getting out into the community. And lo and behold, in our own research, we're beginning to see that in one of our most recent programs to provide financial education for family caregivers to lower the out-of-pocket cost of care by helping them to navigate some community resources uh, to displace some of those costs. And so through conversations with Dr. Dry, I realized, you know, actually, maybe there's a way that we can make these interventions less intensive, a little bit easier for caregivers to participate in and and actually for organizations delivering these programs to deliver less staff time, right? And so we're looking at, um, for this financial education program, we're getting really good feedback on it, but we're not getting good attendance. Only pe People are only attending about three out of five sessions. So kind of in our next iteration that we've worked on with, with Chitra is uh, how do we take AI and integrate it into our programs to make it more flexible, to make it more tailored, and make it more relevant to our family caregivers. And I, I'm very hopeful about that potential of mixing AI plus psychoeducation. Thank you so much. Um, I always, that's a really, just another really good example of, you know, how nursing is not only a collaborative profession, but also a really big interdisciplinary profession as well. So nursing is, is really everywhere, and this is just another great example uh, for us. Dr. Voss, would you like to continue? Yeah. So I just sat here and I thought, when did I experience AI the first time? And it was actually 1985 
when I was in nursing school, I was in the ICU. And our ICU had a um, cardiologist who wanted to predict risk for and, and cardiac outcomes. So he had written his first program there in Germany. And um, uh, it, was, it was really fascinating to be for six weeks in the ICU. Unfortunately, he died of a massive heart attack at the age of 45. And so everybody sort of laughed and, and dis disregarded what he had developed instead of really taking this forward. And then my professional career took me into HIV. And so um, I, um, especially during my time at the NIH, when I dealt with genomics and understood how neural networks function uh, to, to predict certain genetic outcomes, uh, I understood the power of AI much more. And so AI has followed my career on a continuous basis without me pursuing it so hard <laughs> as, as a professional goal, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Voss. Uh, it's very excited to hear kind of how AI has progressed right along with your career. Dr. Knighton. So does anyone remember the, um, what is it, the uh, iBox and the, I mean the Xbox and the Connect. So I used to play Dance Central all the time. <laughs> and so of course during that time I was still working in clinical settings, so not to date myself. And you're always seeing problems, right? So and I'm sure some of you see this now being in class. And just with you all focusing on QI, it could be someone not cleaning their hands. Um, think about the intake and output, right, of a Foley bag. Think about the fact that you're trying to remember a patient's I's and O's. So me, I was always thinking about solutions and saying to myself, how can I solve this individual thing? How can I solve this individual thing? To learn that maybe it's not necessarily a problem that's focused on the environment, but how do you make the environment more smart? So I started with that camera, so that Connect uh, camera off of the Xbox, and said, well, if it can create images, meaning like colors of things, why is it that I can't code things to make it make sense? So for example, if the, if the patient in the bed, let's say is the orange image that you would be dancing for on the Xbox, and let's say that the Foley bag is coded to blue, and then you have the IV fluids that are coded to, let's say, blue, but then you have the fluids that you're consuming to pink, why is it that we can't do equations to make it make sense? Then if someone, let's say that orange image in the bed is not moving, then if they haven't moved in two hours, is that your Q two hour turns that can then tell that nurse, hey, the patient needs to be turned. So when I think about artificial intelligence and kind of blending it into what it is that we do, you all are in this space right now to start thinking about solutions of how do we make the environment more smart opposed to continuing to come out with this device, that device, this device. It's not that we're not intelligent as nurses. It's not that we're not intelligent as students. It's how do we then begin to merge what it is that we know to stop thinking so much about workarounds, but to help us think about how does our environment become more smart to help us do our job better. As we know, documentation is a thing right now. So with our EHR, with the fact that I mentioned in this RGB camera, and now with this imaging, how do I now connect all of those things to say, now for that patient that's in that bed, how do we unobtrusively monitor them to be able to keep them safe without us having to change the environment and constantly creating more and more workarounds when we know that technology is gonna be flawed? So that's some of my work that I'm doing right now, so more so in a simulation-based setting to just see what the feasibility of is it to even be able to work. But now that I'm starting to view it from that standpoint, how do I then apply that to the patient smart dispenser that I'm working on and some of the other projects? Dr. Knighton, that is very interesting. So thank you very much for sharing. And as you can see, um, you know, with this panel, like I said in the beginning, we have individuals from a variety um, of different industries and um, academic positions um, and just different clinical practice areas as well. So I'm really excited to kind of hear everyone's different perspectives about these uh, next few questions here. Um, and so the, the next question that I have, um, and you know, if 
this is something that you feel you have a good answer for, they would like to add, add, um, add on to, this is not for anyone in particular, are just what are a few practice opportunities that AI-enabled technology um, can influence you know, nursing research or practice or education or anything else that you could think of? So one of the things that I'll bring up is staffing. So as you know, we still don't have any staffing metrics. One of the nuances that exist right now is that in order for you to really truly capture what a nurse does, no one captures how much we have to go and look for things inside of rooms. I used to say that about 90% of my job was looking for something. That time accounts for something, the documentation, answering the phone calls. So when you think about, let's say, artificial intelligence, being able to gauge your behaviors, being able to capture what it is that you're doing within that moment and say, hey, these are some ways for which you can save time, it'll help that nursing student, let's say, that's just coming out to be able to manage their time better. If, let's say, they're is issues when it comes to documentation and you're not documenting something thoroughly, something being able to assist you to make more thorough decisions because it's aware of what it is that you typically would type in and being able to give those recommendations. As we know, documentation makes a huge difference when it comes to patient care and patient outcomes. So being able to see ourselves within our work and having something to be able to help drive those decisions, or I would say decision support tools could be a few of the ways that we could use it. Thank you so much, Dr. So. Knighton. I really enjoy that environmental perspective. I know when I, my first thought at least was when I was hearing about AI and nursing was thinking more about the patient side, but your envi environmental perspective is, is very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing. Dr. Voss? I, I want to piggyback on what you said because um, when I came to the PhD program, one of the things that for me was absent was data science. And I said, uh, as nurses, we are documenting all day long. We are generating enormous amounts of data. We do blissfully nothing with this data. And we, we have to own our own power. If we are able to use this data out of the electronic medical record and it informs our practice, then we're truly able to uh, show the world who always says, I don't know what a nurse does. I know what a doctor does. So that's why I pushed in the PhD program very strongly for implementing a, a mandatory data science class. And if I would be king for a day, you as undergraduates would do this as well because I believe the sooner you are exposed to that, um, the, the, the more you will do and the more you will recognize the, the power that's surrounding us with this data. And over here in the community setting where my work is done, uh, I just see a lot of opportunity. Actually, I'll go back to the very first study I ever completed, um, which was learning about caregivers' information needs. How do they navigate community settings? And I remember being really off-put by hearing these kind of very visual images that they, they use to describe uh, community systems navigation, which was, it's a maze, it's a wall, it's like a dance, which is not what you want caregivers to go through when they're looking for resources to care for their family members. And so I think that's one of the reasons why uh, when I had the chance to work with Dr. DeRay and learn about her technology, what, one of the things that most excited me about it was this, this, this ability to anticipate needs. So, um, for example, she has a conversational AI on NuviCare, which when caregivers are searching for information, not only does it provide synthesized answers similar to how you might with uh, ChatGPT if you've ever played around with it, but also anticipates their, their next need. So, hey, you searched about advanced directives. Do you wanna learn more about supported decision-making? Because oftentimes you find with caregivers, they don't know what they don't know. And so this is a tool to get them more information. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Durai, is there anything you would like to add? Sure. Uh, amazing examples uh, Dr. Knight and Voss and uh, uh, Maya gave. I want to synthesize it from an AI perspective so that uh, we can. So, uh, you have heard of many, many different AI 
uh, based reasoning or pattern recognition systems uh, uh, being utilized. I think I last I counted from, you know, I saw on FDA, FDA has provided clearance to more than 700 AI enabled medical devices, right? It goes from image uh, analysis, image reconstruction, a lot of use of AI in radiology, image based processing, and so on. Where that that has that has been around, and uh, as as you can see from the number of devices FDA has uh, provided approval to, uh, it's it's growing, ever expanding. The recent excitement is all in what you know I would call these conversational uh, interactions interfaces powered by AI, right? So they become an extension to the care we receive within the hospital and clinic. And uh, um, Kyle gave a very nice example of uh, how uh, in Nubi Care, the AI uh, provides evidence-based insights about care management uh, uh, anytime, anywhere from any device. Uh, I also, so, so think of this whole conversational AI and, you know, uh, chat GPT, we can't, uh, uh, you know, uh, read uh, uh, one more article about chat GPT N uh, uh, these days. Uh, so they're all, you know, evolving and you're seeing the next, uh, next improvement and uh, improvement in that entire conversational uh, uh, AI, which become, which can become the extension of uh, care providers uh, in settings other than uh, other than um, uh, clinics. Uh, I also see opportunity uh, for uh, I, uh, automation, automation of the nursing professional work, uh, work close. And Dr. Knight um, uh, uh, gave a fantastic example of that, right? This is all about uh, how do we understand the repetitive task, uh, which can benefit from uh, using sensors and sensor-based data collection and uh, reasoning. Dr. Voss alluded to big data uh, analysis and ultimately turning it into, you know, a useful action uh, that, uh, reduces the uh, the burnout and reduces the, the tedium of the same task. So uh, that's how I tend to kind of look at clusters of uh, uh, the AI technology maturity, uh, you know, aligning with the with the needs in in the in the in the nursing profession. Thank you so much, Dr. Durai. That was that was great. And Again, I really enjoyed hearing all the different aspects from everyone. So Dr. Durai, you know, you're giving us the pure AI you know, uh, background information of everything that we're discussing, which is, which, is a, which is a very important part of our discussion today. But you know, Dr. Mayer, you're talking about the information and health literacy side. Dr. Voss, you're talking about big data. And Dr. Knighton, you're talking a lot kind of about environmental conditions. So it's really interesting to hear all of these different um, you know, areas and opportunities that AI um, could become involved in in, in nursing care. And so given that you know, we're all coming with in, in looking at AI in nursing with a few different views, um, what are some factors that you think are barriers to greater implementation of AI in nursing? And anyone, feel, please feel free to start. I think uh, important barriers are um, technology literacy, um, the uh, being afraid of being observed by something artificial and interacting with something that is artificial, that is, um, that is n not a real person. I think those are really three major issues that we have to overcome in AI technology of how do we um, disclose that I'm with an AI, with an artificial t t uh, uh, agent, uh, on the line and chatting um, because um, that turns off a, especially a lot of older adults. Yeah. That's a very good point, Dr. Voss. I know, I mean, I messed up my microphone like two minutes before this started, so te um, technological literacy is not something that, that comes easy to all of us. Um, but I mean, I'm sure we've all seen in the clinical setting as well, if you've been on a floor where there are a lot of computers that are broken or just there aren't enough computers, you know, that just having the physical technology in room, let alone making sure that it works, definitely poses a challenge. I would say some barriers are for one, nurses not being at the table. And so when a lot of technologies and a lot of different things that use AI come about, they're not necessarily meant directly for us, even though we end up being the end users of them. 
And so it leads us to having to do more workarounds as well as it leads to medical errors. So when someone does, let's say, bring forth some sort of technology that is AI-based, that is meant for nursing, we're likely to reject the use of it because we don't understand it, but not understanding how a nurse may have been at the table to develop it. Oftentimes when we're considered as a part of the conversation, it's not during a development phase, it's as the end user. And even though we're considered as end users, it may be, let's say, a select group of nurses. So they may only take someone from a large hospital or it might be a community-based hospital. And we all know that if you've practiced in one clinical setting, you've practiced in one clinical setting. So no clinical settings look alike, right? But they'll take something and then think that it's meant for various settings. So I think one of the barriers is gonna be the uptake of it. It's gonna be not considering nurses um, at the table when it comes to the development of it. And I think a third part that we don't think about enough is how does research play a part of that? Many nurses may come up with different instruments, different tools, and we don't recognize that after we've studied, let's say, the validity and reliability of the tools, and we know that this particular construct leads to this thing, or we know what that predictive analysis look like, we never take into account the fact that that is a part of some company's algorithm. So they've already taken the work for which we've done for many, many years and have taken those questionnaires and have taken you know, our analysis and have turned it into tools and essentially are bringing it back to us to be able to use. And because we don't pay attention to what that relationship looks like, we're very less likely to take our questionnaires or to take the things that we create and let's say do an invention disclosure form or find out if there's some intellectual property there. We assume that, hey, well, it's a questionnaire. We'll put it out in the literature. It means nothing. But that is literally the basis, you know, the predictive basis for which a lot of AI is built. And so I think once we stop taking that for granted, then we'll be able to have that seat at the table that I'm mentioning. So kind of two points here. I think one of the barriers comes down to how we communicate what AI can do. Um, so if you tell a caregiver that an AI-driven technology can do something and it doesn't perform that, that's going to frustrate them. That's going to be another burden. And so uh, Dr. Dure and I, I'm sure you're, you know the example I'm going to give right now. We had a caregiver, we have a community advisory council, and uh, one of our caregivers was reviewing um, how we wanted to do an applied use of the NuviCare system for our intervention. And she was kind of a skeptic too. She said, you know, I just don't want a tool that goes, do you mean, do you mean this and not this when you type into it? So we wanna make sure that um, we don't frustrate anybody with expectations that aren't realistic for AI. Um, the second thing is, I think it also comes back to the research is, you know, what's the appropriate balance? So I think there are always going to be those, those tasks that won't be, we won't be able to completely transfer them to an AI driven technology, but we're still early goings. We're still trying to find out what is that balance between the human touch and what AI can do. And it's not just what works, the efficacy side, it's also the acceptability side. What are we willing to accept AI to do for us? Wow, lots of great thoughts. Dr. Duray, is there anything else that you would like to add? Sure, uh, just a dueling thought. One is from a technology side, and I completely, uh, agree with uh, Dr. Knighton, right? That uh, we need to, technology should be building solutions with and for and by uh, people with lived experiences. You've heard of uh, you know, terms like co-design and uh, increasingly more and more people started using these uh, uh, phrase, people with lived experiences. So if I, have, if I want to roll out a solution with Dr. Knighton and her team, I better have uh, her and her team at the table right from there, right? Uh, get go from uh, designing the solution together to understand with empathy what they think and say and feel and uh, do when they are using, when they would be using the system, when it would be built, etc. So I think it's a, a technologist need to uh, not build and throw it over the wall, so to speak. And that's not the way that I think uh, that, that, 
uh, shift needs to happen uh, that we are really uh, co conspirators or uh, partners in the design. The other side I would say also is the, um, from the users, from nurses, the, you know, the, from the nursing professionals, um, I think AI is here to stay, whether we like it or not. And I know some people have a very dystopian view of the world that it is going to take over. But it's really, if we can embrace, have a mind shift in terms of this is a tool, just like we did not protest calculators, right? <laughs> now we use calculators, it's not taken. Off. So this is AI based solution. It's here to help me be more productive, do my job at high quality, defect free, you know, uh, with, uh, reduce my uh, uh, any safety concern and so on. I think that mind shift will also help uh, reduce the barrier of uh, embracing and designing uh, together with the technologist uh, AI solutions that will uh, get embedded into your workflows and, uh, uh, you know, provide a lot of benefits to all around, everyone all around. Very much, Dr. DeRay. So it seems like a, a general consensus of this panel, um, at least, is that with given how quickly this technology is developing, there's a concern that nurses won't have a seat at the table throughout this whole process, as you were saying, Dr. Knighton. Um, and then kind of expanding upon that, there's a, there's a lot of concern that this will end up being a burden. Um, on nurses and not necessarily something that's that's going to help. So I, I want us to just kind of keep that in our heads for a moment as we go to a, a question from someone in the audience. Hi, um, I'm a third year uh, nursing student here at Case. Um, <clears throat> so my question kind of relates to, from like my clinical experience and what I've seen at work, um, what is the discussion surrounding like how you balance patient safety with all of this? Obviously, like I'm sure that's something that everyone's thinking about, but for me, it's like how do uh, the nurses and the people that will be implementing this like know that this is something they can rely on for patient safety and like that this is always going to work since like you know it's. I don't turned off. Um, but in terms of like how you can rely on it as like if there's an algorithm to it or you know how can we rely on this as like it being safe for our patients I guess. That is a valid question by the way and I want to say that just with let's say medical devices or anything else that make it inside of any care setting by the time it should be in the care setting it should have undergone extensive testing to where it does, let's say, have um, a low level of failure, we do understand that things happen, right? And so that is always going to be our concern of, let's say, if there's AI-based early warning systems that are in place, what happens that one time that it doesn't catch, you know, that early warning sign and it ends up, you know, turning into an adverse outcome for a patient? And actually, that's something that none of us would want to happen. And I know that like innately, let's say generations that have, let's say, that perspective of patient care pre-AI or going into AI, and I can describe that because I'm a part of the phase where there was, or the generation where there was no internet and then there was internet. So you can relate the two or a floppy disk versus, you know, the now plug in USB. So there's always gonna be, let's say, that generation which you're in of being able to teeter-totter between the two. And there's that uncertainty, but then it comes down to reliability. And I think this is what we were starting to get into when we were talking about harms. My biggest concern when it comes to artificial intelligence is data equity. So right now, I know that we do not capture data in a way for which it is equitable, that when we're talking about trying to eliminate health disparities, and I'm not just saying just based off of race and ethnicity, it can be for rare conditions, right? So AI is so gun ho on predicting this particular diagnosis that it misses a rare diagnosis, or we're so dependent on it that we tend to lack in critical thinking. So there are absolutely gonna be barriers to it, and I do challenge, you know, the other perspectives when it comes to what are going to be the ways for which we continue to challenge critical thinking when we have all of these things that are so automated that are going to do jobs for us. So that was a great question. Thank you. I think um, it depends on, on the level, the boundaries that we're setting. Are we allowing AI to turn off and ventilator? 
Are we allowing AI to turn off uh, a dialysis machine? Yeah, so I think, and that's why I think it is so important that nurses are at the table in the development phase, that they say, um, this is as far as I would let uh, AI allow to go in a decision for whatever care uh, is, is delivered to the patient. So uh, that it is not some artificial uh, intelligence that decided, oh, your, your oxygen saturation is 65, that's not feasible with life, I switch off the, the ventilator, yeah. So I think there's a lot of uh, ethicists and, and nurses and, and physicians and care teams to really come together and say, what are we comfortable with that we allow AI to do? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Voss, for those terrifying examples. <laughs> I'll bring us back to the community, community setting. A um, little different, but you know, I think within care... <laughs> Within caregiving, oftentimes one of the struggles families face is what is the appropriate balance between safety and autonomy? And so I can imagine, actually, let me go back to one express, expression and you can kind of get what I mean. Oftentimes caregivers will desire safety for the people they love, but they want independence for themselves. The care recipient wants that independence. And so you can see where there might be a little bit of a struggle. And so there's often this negotiation where you're learning to live with a certain level of risk. So for example, I can imagine an AI tool that could look around your home and identify fall risks, kind of like those tools that are looking in your fridge and identifying recipes you can make based on the ingredients. Dr. DeRay, we probably need to think of an app for that actually after. But um, you, know, you might look at your living room and maybe there are you know, rugs, rugs that are loose and trip hazards everywhere. But at the same time, you might say, that's my living room and I like how it is. And that's okay with me, I'm gonna live with that risk. So I think AI can inform um, you know, how we wanna make decisions about safety. Yeah. Let me just add uh, one thought to it. All of you teed it up so well. Terrifying example. You know, I was thinking, my goodness, I, the only AI I built before I, during the economic crisis was deciding whether someone gets the right kind of uh, home assistance or you know rental assistance to help them stay in the uh, stay in their homes. Uh, uh, scientists generally agree uh, that successful AI deployments in the real world have have always uh, had human in the loop. So uh, the AI, uh, to Dr. Meyer's point, it's not designed to be so completely a, a autonomous that it is deciding to, you know, uh, switch off the, uh, uh, take out the, your, uh, you know, rug outside, uh, which you put in a very uh, strategic fashion in your uh, room and so on. So there is always a uh, human in the loop. The human in the loop could be someone whom the users may not see it, they were uh, embedded into the design during the design phase so that it was built in a secure and safe manner. Or it's often we, we ourselves train ourselves to speak in a way, interact with it in, in a way that we are not causing those, uh, uh, you know, safety raising uh, concerns. So human always in the loop. It was a great discussion. So we, I mean, we hit ethics um, and we, we hit health equity as well. Um, and so thank you very much for that question, Amanda. That, that was a very good one. And uh, we do have another uh, student question here. Data equity. Oh, data equity. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lane. I'm a third year nursing student as well. Um, something that stood out to me was when Dr. Voss was talking about, you know, older patient populations and how they may be less um, you know, comfortable with AI or technology in like the clinical setting. Um, and, you know, as a nursing student, I've seen, you know, pushback from potentially like older nurses as well, not being as comfortable with specific like technologies and AI as well. So how... One more. There we go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, how do you guys, um, I guess, see that like navigate, like navigating that in the future, um, just with like future nurses and stuff like that. I think one of the, so my, my mother's 85 and we just put her into a retirement community because she was kneeling three hours in front of the sofa and couldn't come up anymore. And she had her life alert 
which she was deadly afraid of because a voice talked to her. So she thought she was crazy because she heard voices yeah, in, in the middle of the night. So she put it in a drawer so she would not have this life alert on her wrist. Um, many of our devices all have passwords, all have login credentials. And I think we're making it for older adults physically almost impossible to keep up with the technology re revolution if you have six devices and every different device has a different way of getting into it. And so I found two pages of, 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 uh, of security passwords for her and um, none of them worked because they all expired. And so suddenly her own devices were totally useless because we had to all set them to factory setting zero. So, so she lost all of the information all of the pictures. And so uh, one of the uh, AI revolutions could be what is an easy way to get into your device without using all of these trillion different passwords that we are uh, coming up with in our heads. I was uh, saying, absolutely. Oh, you want, I was gonna say, so for those nurses, they actually don't realize it, but they've already, they've already drunk the Kool-Aid. So think about the fact that I remember, I was there when we were still, let's say, having to fax information down to pharmacy and crossing off medications and having to sign off, right? And then this thing came along, which was the EHR. And then you were having to use both the EHR and having to still um, document. And then it went full fledged into the EHR. Now the EHR has all of these different capabilities People are still behind on the learning curve in terms of having to learn certain things. We were pushing around. Remember, we went from a manual blood pressure cuff, right? Now there's automatic cuffs. We've gone from having to chase down a Dynamap to now it being right there on the wall in the room. And so I'm just bringing that up to say is you're always, when you're talking about innovation, you're going to have the early adopters. And then you're gonna have the laggards. You know, there's gonna be people that are not gonna come along, but what ends up happening is you're gonna find nurses are gonna either retire out of the system or either they're gonna they're gonna learn. And just kind of adding on to Dr. Voss story in terms of thinking about his mom, I think about my mom, my grandma, you would what you would have never gotten them to use a cell phone. And now they're texting, they're like, hey, don't call me, send me a text message. And this is something that you couldn't have imagined, right? Coming from literally a cell phone that was about the size of a cordless phone, and now look at where we are, where it's a mini computer in our hands. And so I always say that I know that we tend to worry about those older nurses, but I say as the generations of technology evolve, nursing has had to come up to speed with that and in some ways have been behind because we don't think that we have to adopt it, but we have to get on a program and we have to get ahead or we'll get left behind. Yes, I can ask the question. Um, hi, and thank you for this, this panel. I was at uh, the AI, information meeting about a month and a half ago related from the medical school and using AI with regard to the academic side. And I've been playing around with it since then to see what it could and couldn't do. And I wanted to get your thoughts on using it to formulate, organize interventions around a clinical problem with the idea that you're coming to this with a knowledge base, your professional background, the ability to intervene with regard to safety. So this would, with in chat GPT, you can enter an issue such as pain control and your clinical decision making, making all of a sudden gets informed and revised in what I consider a new and exciting way, because you think of things that I thought of things I hadn't, I mean, chat GPT thought of things I hadn't thought of or organized in the way that it organized things. So I was wondering to get your thoughts on using this and also using this with students. Um, 
Are we ready to do that now? Are we ready to encourage students to consider using things like chat GPT to enhance their uh, experiences? Shall I take that? <laughs> so, uh, in a nutshell, you know, you can see Chat GPT's uh, organization, OpenAI CEO himself said, I just want to make sure I quote him, it is incredibly limited and it is a mistake to rely on it for uh, making any important uh, uh, decisions right now. So that's why I think, you know, they are not using it. Uh, it all the use cases they are showing are all uh, non-legal, non-medical uh, non related. Chat GPT is fantastic as a writing assistant, right? Or suggesting uh, uh, how to plan your uh, Sweet 16. So all of those benign use cases, because at the end of the day, think of this as a statistical machine, which is uh, trying to always guess, given the words it has, you know, given the question it has heard, what is the next word statistically meaningful from the billions of documents it has read, literally, you know? So that is what is going on within that, uh, you know, if you consider that as a, an automation and machine. So given that, I, I would say it is uh, disarmingly uh, human-like in its responses, in providing plausible sentences uh, together because it has trawled through billions of documents we humans wrote. So that's why the responses seem very uh, familiar to us. It's the documents we wrote, but it is not yet, uh, it does not have the reality of uh, uh, what those sentences uh, uh, imply. There have been so many examples of how you can break chat GPT, you know, even so. Uh, I think a lot of our knowledge what we would call common sense is not yet built in. And uh, that will be a very crucial uh, uh, factor in terms of uh, us beginning to rely on chat GPT. Uh, because currently uh, it hallucinates what that means. That's a term, term, terminology Google introduced in terms of AI systems, which are generating these uh, uh, sentences, language uh, forms, uh, which is, semantically uh, plausible sentences, syntactically, grammatically correct, but underpinned by no reality at all. And uh, that is a very scary thought. Uh, as you can imagine, um, any without safeguards, if you were to use in uh, critical situations, it can mean, uh, it can have profound consequences. Can I add on to that really quick? So I actually think, Andrea, it is in a way ready to be implemented into academic settings. And it's based off of the fact of what you mentioned, Dr. Dura, and just the fact that it has a lot of errors in it. And so to me, having those errors with, let's say, a writing prompt that we know is going to push out inaccurate information, then drives our students' intellectual ability to think past why is this prompt wrong? Why is that the information that's provided wrong? And what is it that you would do in order to be able to make it right? So I think that it can actually push intelligence in that if you're taking this thing and it's stringing together stuff to sound logical, how do you then question its logic with the things that it's stringing together? And so I think it actually provides a learning opportunity opposed to us saying that it's not ready to be as smart as a student, it's challenging our students to be able to share their intellectual capability of why they're smarter than ChatGPT. And I think the train has come and gone. It's left the station. ChatGPT had in the first week a million users. No innovation in the world has ever had that uptake in the first week. It took the iPhone a whole year before it had a million users. And so I, asked, I, I did two experiments. I actually asked ChatGPT to write me a thousand word essay uh, about the social determinants of health. And it printed this out. And then I said, okay, and now put references into it. And I printed it out. And then I took it unbeknownst to Dr. Meyer, to Dr. Meyer and said, could you grade this, what you would give this? And she read it and she said, huh, it's about a C plus. So if you're <laughs> fine with a C plus, then you rely on ChatGPT. Or you, you can use this 
like one of my doctoral students who says, if she cannot figure out a sentence to say it more intelligently, she asks ChatGPT to give her suggestions of how to say this, this sentence differently. And so I think there's a lot of learning potential. Um, but will it be the B and end all? No. It will be a C plus because it is words artificially connected to each other. Whether they really make sense, and they are true, uh, that is on you to really check is what it says actually sensical and, and uh, gives you a better product than you would have come up by yourself. And as I recall, you said I was being rather generous. I mean, <laughs> say too. <laughs> but I think that's a really good point, too. So it's not just um, a tool to generate ideas, but I think also the feedback capacity. So, for example, on uh, I use Grammarly. I don't know if anybody else uses this. And so I get a report at the end of the week, and it tells me, you were very friendly this week in your emails and your writing, or you were rather direct, Dr. Meyer. <laughs> and so... That way, I can kind of gauge, you know, how is my communication going? What kind of mistakes am I making? And so it's a tool for learning in that way, too. Well, I just want to, um, once again, extend thanks to all of our panelists for being here today. Uh, I think we had a, a really great discussion um, about AI and, and also a lot of other topics from data equity and health equity um, to, to, to ethics. Um, and, and again, just it, it all goes back to the true interdisciplinary nature of, of nursing. And I, I also do want to extend my thanks to everyone um, in the room today and everyone on Zoom today um, who has participated. Uh, as a reminder, um, these recordings will be available on both the Veal Institute's website and the FPB website as well. And we're going to turn it back over to Dr. Hickman. Well, thank you all again. It's, a, it's been an engaging and informative conversation. I've learned a lot more than what I walked in this room with in terms of artificial intelligence, the challenges ahead, and the opportunities. So I, again, I want to extend my sincere appreciation to the panelists, to Michael and the Ville Institute for pulling this together. Um, one closing note, and for those who need the contact hours, uh, the QR code is here on the screen, and it will be placed on our links uh, for those who join us on via the social media channels. Michael. Great. Um, just a couple of, of quick plugs about upcoming programs and then ways to get involved. I mean, it's really awesome seeing such a great group of students here. Thanks to the couple students that volunteered to ask questions. Um, for those um, interested, tomorrow at 4 o'clock, we have an event. Um, the founders of Overdrive, which is a Cleveland company, which um, is sort of the back-end technology that that um, sort of is behind a lot of ebooks. Um, so Steve and Lori Potash will be on campus at four o'clock. Free food, students. So come on by. Um, I also just want to do a plug for two fellowships because we've got um, such dynamic students and faculty in the room. One is an a, um, undergraduate fellowship for those of you that are rising sophomores or juniors. Um, this is the Veal Snyder Fellows. This is the first year we've had this program. So we have 12 um, undergrad fellows. You'll, we go out to San Francisco. There's another travel trip, and it's sort of a year-long um, kind of entrepreneurial journey. Um, you don't have to have a startup idea to do the – you just have to be kind of entrepreneurial interested. interested. Um, so that application is up on our website right now. And secondly, to our, to our faculty colleagues, both on the panel and, and in the room, um, last year we piloted a small faculty commercialization fellowship um, with two colleagues in engineering and a colleague in arts and sciences. Again, I think it's for student, for faculty that are interested in, in, um, in uh, taking that sort of entrepreneurial journey. And so um, I know Mindy Bile, my colleague, is on the Zoom. We haven't posted that yet, but we'd love to see folks from the School of Nursing. Um, we've really loved partnering um, with you guys on a bunch of programs. I will say, lastly, um, I was um, asked, uh, I was with um, Jack Fitzgerald and Joyce Fitzpatrick at the um, Shaughnessy Nurse Leadership Academy event in January. And I asked at that event, how many of you had heard in the crowd, how many had heard of ChatGPT? And there was like two hands. So it's amazing <laughs> between now um, in January and, and uh, April, um, how many people are talking about it. But thank you, Ron, and thanks, panelists. And uh, Nick, you did a great job moderating. You're like our go-to nursing moderator. By the way, we're going to have future events. I want to see more nursing students moderating these panels. So um, with that, thanks very much. <laughs>
you, I want to oh. see a conversation between you and Shaker. Like, I, I would probably understand half of it. <laughs> no. Good question. <laughs> no.